when you're talking about human performance for these organizations, this train the trainer concept with human performance, it just, it just doesn't work. While we have these pillars of conditioning, nutrition, sleep, stress, resilience, we don't weight those pillars individually because we believe that they're all codependent on each other. Having this wearable technology integrated onto our platform is massively beneficial for a ton of ways. Great, Paul, it's good to see you again. Yeah, um, great to see you. I'm excited to do this conversation. We spoke a while ago, but you have been one of the really inspiring companies out there doing incredible things. And why don't we start about some of the prehistory? What were you doing before you started O2X? Yeah, yeah. So prior to O2X, I served uh, a little over 11 years in the uh, U.S. military. Um, I served as a SEAL uh, on pretty much East Coast SEAL teams. I enlisted in the Navy uh, August of 2001, so less than two weeks before September 11th. Um, had, a, had an awesome experience uh, during my time in the, in the teams. I, I think I had luck and timing from, from a standpoint of being able to do something where I really had the opportunity to serve our country and to do something in a meaningful way and got to do that with such a great group of people. So I did that from... August 29th, and then I ended up exiting the SEAL teams right before 2013, so end of 2012. And funny enough, or coincidentally enough, I started O2X with Adam LaRue and also there's another co-founder here and managing partner, Gabriel Gomez, who was before our time in the military. But Adam and I uh, served pretty much side by side the entire time in the military and through the SEAL teams together. So I met Adam going through training in 2000. Right around 2002, early 2002, and I ended up on the same SEAL teams with Adam my whole time. My whole time deployed with Adam a bunch as well. Worked for Matt, worked for Adam. He was a he was an officer, and I was on the uh, enlisted side. And so we pretty much entered around the military around the same exact time, and then got out right around the same time as well. When I had exited the, the military, I had met Gabriel Gomez just a little bit before Adam had, and uh, Gabriel was also a, a former SEAL and had a, a ton of experience just in the business world and the private sector and, and done a lot of work. And Gabriel actually invested in O2X and really seeded the, the original capital to, to formalize the business. And we really got started in like early 2000. 14 is really when the company took off and we've been off to the, the roads ever since. Incredible. I wanted to ask you some more questions about the SEALs. First of all, why did you join? Do you remember the reasoning that you have back in the day? Yeah. So I didn't, you know, I'd be lying if I said like I joined. One, it was pre-9-11, right? Like I said, I, I enlisted right before. So I, I didn't have this like call to service of the nation was under attack and I felt like I needed to do my part um, in, in complete honesty. That really wasn't the case. I definitely wanted to serve my country for sure. My dad was in the military, but I didn't come from a family that was like pushing that on me by any means. I was, I was an active kid, right? And I did not like the classroom setting. I played competitive sports growing up, came from a great family. And so I think it was more it was more of a realization probably around my junior, senior year of high school where it was like, you know, everyone I knew, I went to a Catholic high school in Massachusetts and pretty much the entire class was moving on and going to, to college. And I just, I didn't really want to follow that path. I played high school hockey, wasn't g good enough to really go anywhere in hockey. I probably would have played at a low level in college anyway. And so I really wanted to take the challenge. I saw the SEAL teams as a group of in my opinion, not professional athletes or by any means, but just something that I read a bunch of stuff. And if, hey, if you don't quit and you try hard, you're in shape, you get a chance of making it. So I looked at them as, well, this is the best of the best. I went and talked to a bunch of different recruiters and other branches, and I thought that one looked the most challenging. And it was really more of a something I wanted to put myself through. I, I believed I could do it. I never would vocalize that to, to anyone, but I believed I could. And so I really, if I, to answer your question more streamlined, I, I think I did it for the challenge. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something that mattered. And I really felt like that was the right path for me. I, in a lot of ways, I feel like I was 
raised in the SEAL teams. I came from a great family with great parents that raised me to the best of, of their ability. But as like an adult and like going out and seeing the world, I can't think of a better place um, that I could have really grown up than the SEAL teams. And I still think it's probably one of the best run organizations, if not the best run organization in America. Yeah. The, uh, I will ask you a bit about the leadership lessons from Navy SEALs in a bit, but before we get there, from my experience with the Special Forces, the first week I went in, like the first day, you go inside and you see a sign. Then sign that says everybody can join. Only the ones that can take the training remain, which struck me at the beginning when going in. And then I really realized that after a few weeks, because after the first week, just so many people leave and they give up yeah. their yet. Did you have something similar there? I did. I, I think for me... I was young coming in perspective of the community that I was trying to get into. Most of the guys were at least a few years of college, even if they didn't graduate. Most of them weren't directly out of high school that, that make it through the program. And the example I've said to a couple of people that have asked that question is I just say, okay, look at your look at yourself graduating high school and look at yourself graduating college. And I think 99% of people will tell you those are two different humans right like the amount of growth you have in that amount of years is it's pretty significant those four years from being 18 to 22 or 23 or something like that that's it, it's just a big difference so for me when i went in i was i think i had some level of luxury in the sense that i didn't know what it looked like. i didn't have i didn't have the thought of oh man this really stinks i'm living away and college was so much more fun or for me, it was like I just left the house and I in training. I'm like, yeah, this this sucks, but I didn't know any better. So there's that advantage. But the flip side of that is that's also the first time I left my house, right? I left left my siblings and my mom and dad, and I and I go at 18, 19 years old, leaving on leaving high school, and, and next thing you know, I'm in this situation. And so I didn't go with the thought of being a stud or being like first place in anything. I just wanted to survive and see if I could make it through the program. But yeah, a- absolutely. It was like a mess of people. We had a couple hundred people in the class, maybe mid two hundreds, I think, right around in doc. And it is amazing how quickly it it filters out. To your point, right? Like it filters out very fast because I think a lot of people think they want to be there, <laughs> and then very it, it doesn't take that long to realize no, this isn't for me or whatever. So I knew I really wanted to be there. That was that was a hundred percent sure. And so the barrier to entry in the teams isn't super hard, right? There's like an aptitude test, there's physical tests. But once you get through that, then it really is just a testament of um, whether you're going to quit or not. It, it, even the, even the, even like the standards, they're hard, but they're not, if you were comparing to like higher end athletes, it's not crazy. The run times, swim times, the obstacle course times, none of those are crazy. What's crazy is the amount of time you're doing it for and just, all the other resilience need during the course of the day, right? Everyone wants to be in special operations, but does everyone want to be at special operations when it's the winter and it's freezing and you're lying in the water and it's a pretty simple evolution where, hey, this thing's going to end when three people quit. And then it's, okay, <laughs> who really wants to be here? It doesn't matter how good of shape you're in. It's how long do you want to be here? And, uh, and that's where I thrive. That's where I was like, all right, I can hang here. Yeah. How how difficult were the, were the first days for you? Because was it a very professional type of training that it really helped you to catch up early, very early? Or was it that you had to endure a lot of pain and then you were able to catch up maybe after three months or something like this? I think I started a little bit behind in the sense of just the... Again, just the age piece. I didn't swim competitively for reasons, or, or for an example, right? So I... It's not like I had a background in competing for time with these runs or these swims or anything. I've never done a time swim in my life prior to Buzz. I remember I talking to my mom and dad being like, hey, I got to do a time swim. I go to the lake up the road. I lived in a tiny town in New Hampshire. Went up to the lake and started swimming in the lake next to my mom on a paddleboard. I'm like, how fast was that? How long was I going? She's like, I've been swimming for three minutes. And I'm like, oh, God, this is exhausting. <laughs> I'm not going to do this. So, I would say for me coming in young, I had like a burning desire to be there. And I definitely think I had that resilience piece pretty 
as an advantage to a certain degree of just knowing I wanted to be there and not really having a moment of, oh my God, I'm going to quit. But yeah, absolutely. Like the first time I was doing the the time swims and the runs and the obstacle course, I was by no means uh, a leader in the pack. It was like right around the middle. And, and that's where I stayed. And then I will, will say like towards the end, you, you do drastically start to improve. And there's that culture shock right from the start. And that that's probably special operations across the board. I would say it's a bunch of sort of average people doing above average or extraordinary things. But it's by nature, right? They throw a ton of people in these programs from the beginning and they want to see the top 20% that get out at the end. And typically the end product, it's not a bunch of people that you would imagine sitting on the cover of a magazine, right? It's a bunch of average people with a, like I said, like a desire to really be there. And that, that makes up the teams. Yeah. What can we say about the culture? Maybe what leadership lessons did you take from there? And what things from the culture from the SEALs did you take? I think, look, I've had great leaders and I've had bad leaders just like everybody else. But I will t- say that some of the best leaders I've had in my life and I believe will ever have come onto the SEAL team. So the, I'd say the biggest piece from the military that I gained from a leadership perspective is it's not just a line of one team, one fight. Like that is the truth. Um, there's no BSing that. Um, you don't check into a team and have that team mold to your personality. That's just not how it works. So if I could take anything away from the leadership side of the teams, it's what I we try to have here is that culture is everything. And there's probably, in my experience, there's no other unit in the military. And I shouldn't say that. The military has got a lot of units that do this. But it, for me, in the teams, the amount of effort that community what's behind their brand and their culture, it's significant. You know exactly your role. There is no second guessing your role. You know what's expected of you. You know what good performance is. You know what bad performance is. And people take a lot of pride with that. Like the the logo means something. The insignia means something. And, and people live and, and die for that culture. And so, so I think for me, from leadership lessons, it's like getting the full team on board with that sort of one team, one fight. We win together, we lose together. Maintaining a standard that's widely accepted and it's not based on an individual, right? Because you, you could have a cancerous personality get into any group and that one person can dilute the entire group and that can't happen right that that's not acceptable i think it's culture i think everything stems back to and not just not just coming from top down right bottom-up culture matters uh, just as much and and we we try to do a ton of that at o2x i i think all of our people here are just they're just great people they live the brand we wanted to be here and we have seen especially with the type of services we provide our people are everything right like they're the ones that we're, we're, we're talking about human performance right so if you don't have a reputable person in front of an audience that doesn't work right so people need to live that brand the the things that stand out to me were one that from the very beginning you would you were not allowed to do anything by yourself as in yes uh, it's always a team of two so you should be walking with two people with with another person all the time you should be doing the exercise with another person all the times your timing is not about your timing it's about the, the the timing of the two people and then you have teams of 10 and so on and goes this way but from the very beginning you immediately learn that it's all about the team it's not about yourself Yes. Yeah. And then the second thing I, I always remember, which is, which is an extreme example, but it's you would never get an order, go and do X. You would actually see the leader of the group go and do X first, and then you just follow them. So you learn that leadership is by doing, and you cannot tell anyone, go and do something you cannot do yourself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the body, the body system, never leave a man behind all that stuff is you're right. It's ingrained from day one. You can't, man, you're not even allowed to go to the bathroom unless you take someone with you and you can't go to the jail or you can't do it. So you're, so it's enforces like you're only as strong as 
as your as your buddy, right? Like it's a team environment. And then yeah, leaning from the front, right? There's a lot of people like do what I say, not what I do in today's culture. And I really hope as we continue to grow here at O2X, like that's never I get, you should never be above doing anything. I, I try to get on the road as much as I can. I'm not afraid to um, get a, get a, try to talk about our product or help help some of our sales folks out or take the trash out or what, whatever it is. No one can people take that for granted. I think, and especially as you start to get more senior within any organization, you start to lose track of of reality and people that can't lead themselves. In my opinion. I shouldn't be leading other people. So living by example in general, I think, is a huge aspect. You can't be someone that's running around telling people how to live their life and how dedicated you are to the company, and then you're a disaster in your personal life. That's not impressive to anyone. And they won't if they're a high quality person. They're gonna they're gonna look right at you and see that you're smoking mirrors anyway. I think if we speak about the sales, we can do this conversation for ten hours. But <laughs> I'd like to speak about O2X. I wanted to hear from you. How did it start? Like, how did you get the idea? And then how did you meet your co-founder? I believe you mentioned uh, that they were uh, in the sales as well. But how did you meet? How did this conversation start? I think the O2X story is very much every entrepreneur story, where it's so many different avenues that we've taken to really grow and succeed as a business. We When we put the company together, It was definitely probably the opposite of the Harvard Business School review on what right looks like. We didn't have a great business plan. We didn't have some long-term strategic goal. What we really built on was from our time in the military, we wanted to build something that mattered. So that was one piece. We wanted to build something that we were passionate about, hence human performance in general. So that fit the mark for us. And then the biggest one is we wanted to do it with people that we respected and wanted to work with, right? So I luckily have business partners that come from a similar background that I have a lot of respect for, both professionally, but also personally. People that you know are going to be there for you outside of, in this case, O2X, right? And so that, that that mattered to me. I would put that over the product, truthfully, without diluting the brand O2X. If O2X was selling ball bearings, I think I could get equally fired up to sell those ball bearings if I were to sell those ball bearings with my business partners and all the folks that have dedicated their life and to work with us at O2X because they're just great people and they want to they want to succeed and they want to deliver a good product and they want to they want to have good careers and so I, I that gets me up in the morning. I, it's the culture, it's the people that we're working with. So when we put the business plan together, it was, it was for those reasons. We wanted to be a human performance company. We actually started doing mountain races. In 2014, we did mountain races in New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, New York, Winter Park, Colorado, um, Vancouver. We started doing executive development programs for senior executives, taking them in backcountry type stuff. We did work with college teams and individuals on building culture and accountability and anything on human performance at large. And um, so we were doing sort of all these things in the first year to create a human performance brand with the idea that we would have a product that would come out of that. And we didn't know if that product was going to be something on the nutrition side, whether it was going to be something on mental performance, it was going to be apparel, it was going to be sneaker. Like we just knew we wanted to build this human performance brand. And so what ended up happening is that the content and the curriculum was really starting to develop more than anything. And so rather than trying to start selling t-shirts or a supplement, we really just kept doing more of the curriculum piece. And so even these mountain races, they weren't just a mountain race, right? They were, they were experiential learning weekend events where people stayed the night and they started at the base of the mountain. They got to the top. We, We brought in human performance experts from around the country and they spoke at these fireside chats and... And then we started getting some teams involved, right? Harvard Hockey brought their team up and raced in it. A bunch of other kind of sport organizations did that. And so we were running these curriculums for these groups after these events, right? And these groups ranged from athletic teams to private companies to what now is the biggest piece, which is the first responder, public safety, tactical athlete, right? That's really our bread and butter, right? What happened right around the 2000, about a year in 2015 or so, we... We linked up with Boston Fire Department 
And Joe Finn was the commissioner of Boston Fire um, for Leaner. I still have a ton of respect for him. He put a huge amount of focus on the health and safety and wellness of his organization. And we were brought in from a, from a guy that happened to be a Green Beret. And, and he brought us in. And he knew what, what we were doing. He said, hey, I think I can get you a meeting with the commissioner. He might be interested in what you're doing for some of these sport teams and some of these other organizations. Um, I think this could be relevant for what we're trying to do with Boston, right? So we went into Boston. We sat down. We met with the labor and the management from the union president and the commissioner and a bunch of other people from health and safety. And the idea was to run a kind of four to five day train the trainer human performance workshop. So Boston happens to have about 35 ish firehouses. And their idea was let's take one member from each firehouse. And it didn't matter if that person was a physical fitness stud or they were super out of shape and hadn't worked out in the last you know, 20 years or whatever. They just wanted influencers. That was the idea we came up with. Let's bring an influencer from each firehouse and we'll run a train the trainer event from human performance. And we were pretty, we were at the infant stages of O2X from a curriculum standpoint. We've now been doing stuff like this for about a year. We didn't have that deep of a bench of subject matter experts, but we did have like a couple, one or two in each field, right? So we had like our performance nutritionist. We had someone that could speak through sleep hygiene. We had someone in stress mitigation and behavioral health, post-traumatic stress, strength and conditioning, some level of injury prevention, PT, um, right? So it was a complete it was a complete package. We're going to run a little bit of our culture side, but also get really into the holistic approach to human performance. So we took one member for each firehouse that came through our program, went through, I think it was five days, a five day workshop and they left and they were fired up, right? They were like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. We haven't had training like this before. Let's do it again. So they called Joe Finn. Joe Finn gets a lot of feedback. We took a lot of feedback and surveys and things like that. And Joe Finn calls us up. He's like, man, he's, these members, like they complain about everything. This is the first training that I've had them go to where they're they're fired up. Let's do it again. If, as long as I have interest, let's run with this. So we went from one person per house for that first kind of showcase event or pilot program to eventually running one person per shift per house. So there's four shifts per house. So we went, we started doing that. Next thing we started running the first week of their training academy. Then we started doing refresher training. So at, at this point now, the years are passing and we had done thousands of, almost the whole department has come through our program at some level. What ended up happening maybe a couple years in is we really needed to see results of the program. And while we had some awesome subjective feedback, we didn't really have the objective results that we needed, right? And we also saw a miss with the trainer, train the trainer concept in the fire service because it was great in theory, but it's unlike the military, as I know you're familiar with, where you might be the subject matter expert in a certain skill. But everybody does that skill and you might bring it back to the group, and you're, but you're doing it on an annual basis and maybe you use it overseas and you come back and you repeat. When you're talking about human performance for these organizations, whether it's a law enforcement agency or fire department or it's a three-letter agency in the government, whatever it is, they're not – this train-the-trainer concept with human performance, it just, it just doesn't work. They're not going through this every year, right? They don't get sleep hygiene classes every year. They don't do performance nutrition every year. They don't, and even if you did train up a couple people to go train the masses, when do they have time for it? It's a collateral duty, right? It's this system that just doesn't work. They have no resources to back them. There's no consistency with the program. So what we started doing is we started looking at that a couple of years in. We're like, man, we have all these people that are fired up. They went through the training, but this is like a sunburn session, right? They go through, they're fired up. That lasts for maybe a couple months and then they go back to their old habits so we started doing other things we started one we developed the o2x tactical performance platform which has a mobile app and a desktop and all that stuff the thing we started doing was we got pretty big into the screenings and assessments getting collecting real data let's see the shoulders knees back hip core let's see how well people are sleeping let's see how well they're eating let's see what their body comp is let's see how stressed they are so we started doing a ton of assessments and reporting we started giving, as our team started to grow, we started giving real-time support through our platforms to all of our subject matter experts, 
um, to include all of our training plans and reach back and all the stuff. And then we were able to take these reports and start delivering these por- reports to the leadership on at, at a minimum of a quarterly basis. But the individuals would be fired up to do this because we'd be able to give individualized reports. And from those individualized reports, they could say, okay, you want to lose weight? Let's help you out here. You want to sleep better? Let's help you out here. You want whatever it is, like we can give tailored plans to people so they want to do it. And then we would take that aggregate down. We wouldn't say, here's what John Smith's body comp is or here's how stressed they are. But we just say, on average, we've got a thousand screenings here. Here's how well your people are sleeping. Here's how well they're eating. Here's the likelihood of an injury rate. And so we were doing that for a, a long time, collecting all this data, and we've been able to save municipalities and organizations millions of dollars with very small incremental changes um, from an individual level. And the, the biggest thing we're doing now, and just to fast forward to the conclusion, it's probably our biggest point, which I know we'll talk about on the backside, is, is you have this training and education component from workshops that can be customized in any way. Other side is you get all the virtual stuff, which obviously you're very well familiar with. Then you have these sort of consulting data reporting screenings. But the biggest thing we've done over the last few years is we're actually putting O2X people on site within these organizations to not look at this like a collateral duty, right? They're looking at this from a full-time perspective that are keeping these programs alive. But the difference is we're not a staffing agency. We don't just drop off pick the field. We don't just drop off a strength and conditioning coach and disappear. That strength and conditioning coach is very much a part of O2X, which comes with the whole power of the company behind, behind that individual. So that's where we are right now. And that's that's been very successful and rewarding. Yeah. Was it at the beginning in Boston, did you, um, because we spoke about the methodology before, before the call, did you it came up with the methodology back then? Was it from the experience that you had with these folks and and let's speak about a bit about the methodology how it works right so great question i think yes and no i think we learned a lot from our time in the in the military prior to o2x about what right looks like from a methodology standpoint we also looked at a lot of stuff that we didn't have right and we were making sure that we wanted to like we didn't want to be a brick and mortar type business because with this population that we serve they're not brick and mortar type people, right? They're on the fields. They were shift schedule. They're gone. So like, we didn't want to have some facility based program that was like great in theory, but no one's going to just only use the stuff at a human performance center or something like that. So that was pretty big. We wanted to mold to the group rather than have the group mold to us. So that was a big part. The second part about it is that we knew it had to be complete in nature, meaning while we have these pillars of conditioning, nutrition, sleep, stress, resilience, we don't weight those pillars individually because we believe that they're all codependent on each other. So we took these pillars, we broke them down into eat, sweat, and thrive, right? Just to make it things in threes, right? So eat is clearly the performance nutrition side of the house. And then we'll put everything in that as far as like supplements, as far as uh, hydration, all, all that stuff, right? So eat is quality, quantity, timing your food, all that stuff, right? The sweat is really, that's everything from injury prevention, that's prehab, rehab, strength and conditioning, energy systems, how to prepare for a workout, how to do the workout itself, how to recover from the, from the workout, everything physically active and movement, right? So that's a sweat category. And then Thrive is probably our, not probably, I'd say it is our biggest pillar when it comes to the amount of stuff we're doing under the Thrive category. And that's in, in the field of tactical athlete, when you think about military units, fire departments, law enforcement agencies, government agencies, the Thrive piece is is massively important. And we classify as, that's like anything neck up, right? So that's mental performance, that is resilience, that is post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic growth, that is, I didn't put sleep hygiene in there, right? So this is, this is neck up, this is the side that ultimately can make or break the individual. But we do look at this these this methodology like a stool, right? You need all three of these pillars. And if one of those is lacking, the stool will fall. And we're pretty big of even the ones that recognize that there's a maybe a resilience or post-traumatic issue going on within a department. Most of them, I think, do recognize that there's an issue there. But if you were to only focus on, let's just say, stress mitigation, and avoid are your people sleeping 
Are they getting? Are they living physically active lives? What are they putting in their body? Are they drinking all the time? Are they? So if you're not staying physically active, you're not sleeping, you're eating like crap, and then you're just doing like breathing exercises. Do you really think you it, it all? You need to do all these things. No different than if you're trying to like get more physically fit and you're eating like crap or you're not sleeping, right? So they, you need all of them. And then the last piece of the methodology is not only is it complete in nature, not only is it codependent on each other, but we're also pretty big at making small incremental changes rather than trying to be the New Year's resolution company. We're trying to say, hey, you know, hey folks, like you're going to go through this training, you're fired up, you're going to meet with one of our experts, you're going to have access to the these virtual things you can go through your screening your assessment. Goal here is to not change who you are overnight. Goal here is to make we say 1% changes, make consistent 1% changes in your life that will stand the test of time, right? Like tiny changes that add up. And that's the biggest part of our methodology. And I will say that has been widely, very well received. And it's tangible to people too. Yeah. That's incredible. So it's, it's a system that works. I want yes. to touch a bit and go a bit more into details, for example. And you mentioned the three pillars. If we take Thrive, for example, you mentioned mental resilience. Can you give us some examples, maybe what, what work is done there and how, how does it work for the folks that use the program and we get an understanding there? Yeah. So in a bunch of ways, right? So from a training and education standpoint, a lot of this stuff is new to this group, or even if it's new, they haven't adopted it because of maybe the stigma that sort of that Thrive Pillar has. So we tie everything back to performance rather than a weakness, right? So we don't say, hey, Michael Phelps isn't doing breathing exercises because he loves breathing. He does it because he wants to swim faster, right? So we tie these into how to nice. perform. And we do that same thing, whether it's visualization drills, whether it's mindfulness drills, how to perform on and off the job, recognizing that what these individuals see in their day-to-day -day life might be normal to them, but it's not normal in general, right? Like you might see something that's very graphic. You might do something that's very extreme. You might say, oh, that's a normal day, but it's not a normal day. And that adds up over time. So we're always going back to, hey, how do you play with your grandkids, right? Like how do you, how is this a longevity game? So we're pretty big on meeting people where they're at and breaking the stigma down and tying it into performance rather than something soft and, and that seems to work well we'll do everything from mental performance on the range showing people how their shooting can improve with breathing to introducing the yoga nidra you know, like sleep basically sleep yoga right during these workshops really just getting people in the headspace and showing them hey if you can control your heart rate variability under pressure you will make better decisions under pressure when people are all amped up and they can't reset and refocus that's where bad things happen. It could be a very small bad judgment call. That's not a big deal. Or it could be could be a life-changing um, incident. So that's pretty big um, to us as well. So I'd say we're, we're always tying it back to performance, meeting people where they're at, and giving real examples of how they can how they can reset. And it doesn't have to be this long, arduous task of I'm going to be sitting here and do, getting into yoga. and doing. It could be something where it's, hey, do I have 30 seconds to control my breathing before I get out of the vehicle. Do I, do I have time to maybe do a couple of these things in the morning or before I go to bed? Like little things. And they add up. Put my phone away when I'm in bed. Make my environment, my habits better, right? Let's get the room cold. Let's get it dark. Let's, let's get a checklist so I can get stuff done before I go to bed so my mind is right. Like all these little things. So it's a lot of training and education, but a lot of it is also like tangible stuff that people can take away and make some lifestyle changes. What? Yeah. So the methodology is tied with the goal, uh, yes. which makes it so much more important. Yes. So that's very similar to the, the SEALs philosophy. It's, it's all about the mission, and then everything else is part yeah. of uh, the training, is part of getting there. That's incredible. It's incredible. We, uh, we mentioned this, but the system needs to be supported by a lot of data. I think we discussed this as well before. Uh, you have been accessing data and then improving the product all the times. Can you speak a little, uh, a little bit about data in general, how you're using it, how everybody's taking advantage of that? Yeah, so the data for us has been like, it's huge, right? One, let's be honest, we partner with organizations that we have to show an ROI on, right? And it goes back to the subjective versus objective results. The great part about data is that it's real. 
right? And it's not something like he said, she said, it's none of that. It's when we do readiness assessments, like we can find out like what the average body comp of the entire group is. When we do movement screenings and we can look at their shoulders or their back or their knees and highlight the likelihood of an injury, we can see that. When we can look at uh, an academy class and we can see here are your results from anaerobic capacity to push, to pull, to any standards, we can get that data. And, and, and the other thing it does too is from like an individual side, sometimes people are just lying to themselves, right? Like when you look at the course of the job, when you're gaining a couple pounds every year over the course of the job and you're on the job for 30 years and you're like, man, a lot, a lot, a lot heavier. Some of these groups that we've, we've done studies on were averaging a pound a month on their first year of the job. It's just this non-sustainable piece that when we partnered with you all a while ago, I think like meeting people where they're at was pretty big. So rather than just collecting data from one device, just for an example, or a broad base, we're going to do a PT test and here are the results. Having this wearable technology integrated onto our platform is massively beneficial for a ton of ways. One, we don't care what device you use, right? If we're working with the army and you have 300 soldiers and some are wearing whoops, some are wearing Fitbit, some are wearing Garmin, some are wearing Polar, like it's unrealistic for these large groups to buy everybody a whoop. They're probably not going to do it, right? And also, people might not want to wear that thing, right? Our thought is we want to grab as much data as we can from different people. And then we, yeah, we're not going to go so far into the weeds on pages and pages down of that data. But from a cultural standpoint, back to the beginning of the conversation, we don't need that level. Like we're not talking about the little tiny, what is the difference of the RAM or whatever. We really need to see like overall, what kind of calories are these people burning? Like how much are we moving a day? Like how overweight are they? What is our, what's the HRV? What is our, what is the basic stuff? And so we can take all that data from a, a wide variety of devices, but also a wide variety of individuals and we can bucket it. So we can say, here's what an academy class looks like. Here's what a certain unit looks like. So that's been pretty big. And then the other thing is it helps our trainers, right? So if you're working with an individual on a um, fitness goal, for example, or you can see this data in real time, what works for them, which is great because that can help change plans and things uh, along that nature. Which data point, you mentioned a couple of times HRV, sleep as well. Which data point is the really most useful that you found or that you are really excited about? Or do you, do you have a much more holistic uh, view of it? Yeah, I think for me, I think you'd probably talk to some of our subject matter experts and they probably, they might disagree. I don't know. It really depends. For me, it's, it, it's, it goes back to the 1% changes in the holistic in nature, right? Like... I'm less concerned of one of these little, like it also can change, right? Depend, you could be drinking one night, you could be like, so I don't think necessarily changing. I, I think it's better to look at like over time, like what is, you know, what does this quarter look like for you? Like how many workouts are you really doing over the course of the last three months? Like how many workouts are you doing a week? How many hours are you really getting asleep just in general? Like I know there's quality of hours and I get that, right? Like I get, yeah, you did seven hours, but you really don't have for I get all that, right? But Again, I still always go back to just lifestyle. Yes, you can do all these things, but like, I can tell you what, if you're probably not drinking, you're saying, you're working out, you're eating pretty healthy, and you're doing some habit and environment stuff for your sleep, you're probably going to see results. People have a morning routine, but they don't have a nighttime routine. For, yeah, I'm generalizing, but like when you wake up in the morning, probably at a fairly standard time in the morning. You wake up, you go to the bathroom, you brush your teeth, maybe you take a shower, depending on what you're doing. You take a shower, you brush your teeth, you will grab some breakfast. And it, that is the same Monday through Friday, and then weekends is a little bit different. But the nighttime routine is, I have four kids, right? Like I could go to bed early, let's say I get to bed at nine, and I have another night where I go to bed at like 1 a.m. I could be, I could eat because I'm out with a client or something like really late at night. Or maybe I could be drinking or not drinking, right? So the, the variety is, is so wide. So for me, it's all about those changes. I know if I don't work out in the morning, probably not going to work out just for my lifestyle, right? Because I say I'm going to do it at lunch. I don't have time. I say I'm going to do it after work. You know, come home to my wife and four kids. I say, you know, we're going to work out. She's like, yeah, there's a, all these things. So I wouldn't say that for me on a data perspective that I'd be so dialed into anything at the micro level personally, 
Now, I think if I was a you know doctor in sleep or one of these mental performance courses, I'd really be studying like, okay, how many breaths and all this stuff. But I think for me, it's like macro level all day long with this crowd to make some bigger results. Yeah, which which also uh, reminds me of uh, of the days in the military because uh, the days are structured in a very similar way every day, and you do the same things repetitively, which gets you into uh, a very different state. Like because you would wake at exactly the same time, you'd go uh, and meet the superiors at exactly the same time, yes. you would go and do the exercise and so on at exactly the same time. So that repetition is uh, it's what works. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Awesome. What about the team internally? What would you say are the characteristics, maybe the values of the, t- the people that work in O2X? And how is the culture there? How is the culture here at O2X? I got to tell you, I'm so blessed. I've had really my entire life. I'm in my early 40s. And like I said, I, I went into the military directly at, directly out of high school. And now I'm in my mid-40s. I've really had two really major careers. One is the SEAL teams, which I think is the best culture ever. And then we have O2X, which is the best culture ever. So it's, I've just been blessed. I've always, if I, if I could, I don't even know how to paint or, or create that again. I don't know if, if I could or if I, but if I were to give advice to my kids, I'd be like, surround yourself with great people and you'll end up doing like great things. And that's, that's here. So O2X, our people are everything. Our culture is absolutely everything. Like, if you think about it, we're not doing breaking science stuff, right? We're ta- Everyone knows you're supposed to eat well. Everyone knows you're supposed to sleep. Everyone knows you're supposed to work out. Every- so you have good people, right? We put on basic education courses that are life-changing to people, but it's tangible, relatable, digestible information you need the right people to deliver that or it will fall short. So we have really good people that can do that. Internally here, the, the people like kind of a, out of an HQ, so we're based in up in kind of the Boston area, but just south of Boston, about 20 or 30 miles or so. So that's like where we're headquartered. We also have an office in the Mid-Atlantic, right in Old Town, Alexandria, near DC. And, and then we have one out in Southern California, near, outside of San Diego. So we have this kind of little triangle going from like an HQ perspective. Um, I got to tell you, like everyone, they all come from different backgrounds. And, and I will say there's a lot of high performers and high achievers in those backgrounds. We put, we do just spend a lot of time making sure that the right people come in the door. I do think that's a big, I do think that's a big advantage that we have is the people that even just get a job here in general, like they're already high performers, but they're going to be our culture. But these people, I got to tell you, man, they are, I don't care if it's marketing, if it's operations, it's the education, if it's anything, customer service, uh, client service, uh, business development, uh, relationship management, right? These folks, they really care about what they do, right? And they're good at it. They're like passionate about it. Some of that's running ops, they're fired up about like how to do this the most efficient way. How do we get the right people in front of the right crowd? Because audiences are different, right? So those people are are just unbelievable. I, I couldn't be more proud to be associated with our kind of age group, HQ type group. And then the other side of the business that we have from O2X is there's really three areas, but the, the, the second area is like these full-time people that are, you know, these are W2 employees, but they are placed within these organizations. So these people are, you know, they're full-time at the FBI, the DEA, the U.S. Marshals, the Secret Service, uh, the Army, the a fire department, a law enforcement agency, right? They're full-time within these organizations and they are living the brand, right? They are O2X. So when you're at the DEA and you guys have an O2X, you're like, they are O2X. So everything they give them from a training and education standpoint, everything they give them from a screening or assessment, the app that they give them, they're like their name's on it. So when, they, when something's not meeting their standard and they're getting mad, I'm getting fired up, which is good. And we're making sure that we're one team. So that's a second bucket. And then the last bucket is it's a very much larger bucket are these sort of subject matter experts that are more contracted to us, right? We have hundreds and hundreds of these folks um, that we're tapping from very relevant fields across a wide variety of human performance sectors. And we're bringing in and we're making sure those people are the right people for the job. And they go through a very arduous kind of training regimen that our HQ Sam controls and so that that's been good so we, we got all three buckets kind of firing on all cylinders but i can tell you that people are very happy here they love their job they love working with each other and then 
like they get the double bottom line. They get to do great things for a great cause, right? So it's it's a, it's a win all around. All that matters. So what, for the last question, I wanted to ask you, what should we expect from the future? And where is O2X going within the next five years? To the moon, baby. Or Mars. We'll go Mars. <laughs> we're going to keep doing what we're doing, honestly. The, the, the industry sector that we serve is very much an underserved population. These military units, these law enforcement agencies, fire departments, these government agencies, they're, they're out there. They're the ones putting their lives on the line. They're doing unbelievable things, and they're underappreciated, and they're underserved. We just need to do more of it. I'd say our biggest growth right now is we want to get as many of these O2X human performance advisors and coaches implemented in these organizations because they can't do it on their own. They, some units might think they can, but they can't. They absolutely can't. If they're doing their job to the best of their ability, they've got enough other stuff to worry about. This is Human performance, in my opinion, is the one area that they should, I don't want to use the word outsource, but they should partner with groups like O2X that dedicate their life on such a specific piece and then, and then connect with them to support and enhance whatever initiative they're trying to run, right? So we want to continue to grow that integrated specialist program. It's probably our biggest piece that we're going to do. And then we're going to keep um, investing in improving that virtual stuff to keep it alive, right? So that's where the, you know, deeper with the data collection, deeper with the wearable technology, deeper with the um, ongoing reporting and analysis so that, these groups are able to walk into the people that control the purse strings and they can say, hey, this isn't me just fired up that I want this for my unit to help my culture, to help my members. There is a very clear ROI in this and I can prove it. I can prove that you're paying this much money in workers' comp claims. I can prove that there's this much injuries in the job. I can prove that we can do something about it. And we've been able to do that for pretty much every client we've had. We've been able to show some extremely powerful data with real-time results and cost-saving metrics to, to improve the resilience, retention, recruitment of these tactical athlete populations. Incredible. Paul, that's been a, a very inspiring conversation. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate you, you having me on here. You guys are doing a great thing.